Hello. Hi, I think we should start. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Anna Morinkova. I'm, I'm a member of uh, UCI Movement Disorders uh, team. I'm, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to our uh, annual uh, Parkinson's Disease Symposium. Uh, I'm excited to see so many people here, so many familiar and new faces. Thank you all for coming. Uh, as many of you know, this uh, symposium was uh, originally created uh, by uh, Dr. Neil Hermanovitz uh, years ago, uh, who built the Movement Disorders Program here at UCI. And uh, uh, we know that uh, uh, all our patients and uh, patients from other areas have been excited to come and uh, hear about the uh, new developments and exciting uh, research and therapeutic developments in the field of, of Parkinson's disease. Uh, the symposium was designed to share this uh, news and knowledge with uh, those uh, you know, people and families affected by this condition. Uh, uh, this event would not be possible without our sponsors, and I'm trying to put this here. Uh, thank you very much for supporting this event. Um, I hope you, uh, that you all enjoy uh, today's event. There will be some live uh, physical therapy sessions and discussions and question and answers after each uh, presentation. And with this, let me introduce our first speaker, Dr. Keith Cochran, who joined uh, our program this year as a Movement Disorders Fellow. Dr. Cochran uh, received his medical degree from Case Western Reserve uh, University uh, School of Medicine, and then he completed his neurology residency training here at UCI, where he served also as a chief resident. And this year, he joined us as a Movement Disorders Fellow. Please welcome Dr. Cochran. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for the introduction. and. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. It's a privilege to, to talk and speak with you all. Um, so as you see here, I'll be talking on the relationship between Parkinson's disease and exercise and some of the potential effects it may have and some of the benefits it may have as well. I have no disclosures to report. Um, so here's a brief outline of what I'll be covering this morning. Um, we'll go through some definitions of Parkinson's disease and exercise just to get everyone onto the same page. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the different types of exercise, as there are many. Uh, we'll talk about some of the barriers that are faced by patients with Parkinson's disease, people who may want to exercise or may be trying to exercise. We'll talk about some of the challenges and barriers faced by researchers who are looking at the relationship between these things. And then we'll go on to some of the effects of exercise on Parkinson's disease and how it may be helpful for some of the symptoms that are troubling for these patients. Um, so I think most of you are familiar with Parkinson's disease and the basics of the disease, um, but it's defined as a chronic, progressive, and disabling disease that has both motor and non-motor symptoms. So chronic in the sense that it happens over long periods of time, progressive in the sense that it tends to get worse slowly over time, and disabling in the sense that the symptoms can cause loss of function and changes in function for people, and they can be very troubling for people. Um, in general, we divide these symptoms into both motor and non-motor symptoms. So the motor symptoms are those that are said to affect the movement of the body and can cause problems with body movement. So those can be things like stiffness or slowness or tremor. They can also include things like balance difficulty or falling. Those would be considered motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And then we have the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And that essentially can be everything else that Parkinson's disease can cause, um, symptoms that don't necessarily affect body movement but affect other things. So those can be anything from constipation or problems with thinking or memory, depression or sleep problems, even hallucinations. All those can be some of the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Uh, then we'll move on to some of the definitions for exercise. Uh, and I think it's important to make a distinction between physical activity and exercise, as sometimes they're used interchangeably, uh, when really they're not quite interchangeable. Um, so physical activity, we would say, is a very broad category and includes essentially all kinds of movement or all kinds of body movement that would lead to use of energy, uh, energy in the body. And that can be anything from 
going for a walk outside to doing chores in the home, even things like getting up out of bed and walking into the kitchen. Um, all those things are types of physical activity. So a very broad category includes many different things. Um, exercise, on the other hand, we would say is a very specific type of physical activity, uh, activity that involves planned and structured and repetitive body movements with specific goals. And those goals would be to improve physical fitness, improve cardiovascular health or heart health, and improve function too. So physical activity, very broad, all kinds of movement and exercise, more specific type of movement with specific goals. Uh, then we'll talk about some of the different types of exercise. In general, we can divide them kind of into two broad categories. So there's aerobic exercise, or also sometimes called endurance exercise, or sometimes called just cardio. Um, so that's exercise performed generally with the goal of improving cardiovascular health or heart health. Um, it's usually done for longer periods of time with repetitive motions, and sometimes is done with the goal of reaching a certain target heart rate and maintaining that over time. So those could be things like um, jogging or using a treadmill to walk or jog, uh, jogging outside, cycling, or using a stationary bike. Um, all those are types of aerobic exercise or endurance exercise. And then on the other hand, we have resistance training. So resistance training um, involves the use of moving a body or a limb um, against some form of resistance. So that could be things like weights, like lifting weights, or even moving one's body against gravity. If you're doing things like push-ups or sit-ups or pull-ups, gravity can be a form of resistance in that way too. And as opposed to aerobic exercise, resistance exercise has the goal generally of improving muscle mass or muscle strength. And again, those things can be things like weight training or use of a resistance band. So those are resistance training. So we have physical therapy here also as a type of exercise, and uh, we have some very talented physical therapists here today too who can maybe describe these things a little bit better than I will, but we'll cover it briefly here. So physical therapy can involve both physical activity and exercise as well. Um, it's usually done under the supervision or always done under the supervision of a trained physical therapist. Um, and the goal generally would be to improve function, improve specific symptoms, or improve independence. Um, and in that sense, it can be targeted for some of these specific symptoms or specific goals in functioning um, for physical therapy. So with that, there can be wide variability in how it's applied and how it's implemented, uh, but still can be a helpful tool um, in the form of exercise that we have for Parkinson's disease. Uh, so we'll take a step back to and um, back from thinking about Parkinson's disease and think about some of the overall benefits for exercise for everyone. And we know, and we've known for a long time, that exercise can be helpful um, in a lot of different ways for, uh, for people. So, of course, it, it can improve cardiovascular health or heart health. It can reduce the risk of things like obesity and cholesterol and diabetes, and that in turn reduces the risk of some of the things that can come from that, like heart disease or heart attacks or strokes. Um, all those are benefits of exercise. There's some information to support that it can improve symptoms of anxiety or depression or improve sleep problems for people. Um, and there is some association with improved cognition or improved thinking and memory in people. We don't know for sure that exercise causes those improvements, um, but it is an association that we see in the sense that people who exercise on a regular basis seem to have improved mental functioning, improved cognition. And similarly, we see an association with healthy aging in the sense that people who exercise on a regular basis seem to be healthier as they get older in life. And again, we don't know for sure that one of those causes the other, but it is a relationship that we see. Um, so why is exercise relevant specifically to Parkinson's disease and why do we care about um, that relationship? Uh, well, there's a lot of reasons, I think, and, and one of those being what we just talked about. So we know that exercise is beneficial for everyone, and so you could make the argument that everyone should be exercising regardless of any diagnosis that they may have. Uh, but of course, there are challenges specific for patients with Parkinson's disease if they may be trying to exercise. It can be harder in certain ways, and so those things are things that need to be addressed if we're encouraging patients to exercise. And then on the other side, we wonder if exercise may be a potential form of treatment for patients with Parkinson's disease. And we have lots of treatments, lots of tools that are available for treatment. Um, and those can be very helpful for treating a lot of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Um, but unfortunately, they don't treat all the symptoms. And some of the symptoms that they do treat, they don't necessarily treat perfectly. So that leaves us, us being physicians and patients alike, wondering if there's things that we can do um, aside from medication or in addition to medication that may help to 
um, improve some of the symptoms, help to improve function, um, or even possibly change how the disease progresses over time or slow how the disease progresses. And that last point, I think, is something that's important to mention and can sometimes be considered kind of a holy grail for treatment of Parkinson's disease. Um, we have a lot of medications that are helpful for treating the symptoms, but as of right now, we don't have anything that we know for sure changes how the disease progresses over time or could slow how the disease progresses. Um, so if we find something that can do that, that could slow down how things move and change over time, that would be very exciting. It would be a neat development. Um, and so we wonder if exercise may potentially have part of that role with Parkinson's disease. Um, so we'll talk about some of the barriers that are faced by patients with Parkinson's disease. Um, and, um, and they can be challenging and overwhelming. So if you look at our friend here, he's maybe overwhelmed and not feeling motivated to exercise with Parkinson's disease. And, and they've looked at what some of these things are specifically with this disease. So they've looked at patients who exercise on a regular basis and patients who don't exercise on a regular basis. And they've surveyed these patients and looked at reasons that they give for not exercising. And some of those reasons you can see here. So things like low expectations, people think that it won't necessarily produce good or worthwhile results. Um, bad weather was given as a reason. I don't know exactly where the study was done, maybe not Southern California, if they were worried about weather, uh, but still can be a problem. Uh, lack of time in the sense that people have busy schedules and may have trouble fitting exercise into their schedules. Pain with exercise can be a problem. Depression, so if people are feeling depressed, they may have trouble motivating themselves to exercise. And fear of falling also was given, so fear of sustaining injury during exercise and patients who may be at higher risk for falls may have balance difficulties. Um, so those are all valid concerns, I think. And I have a few here that are underlined, and that's because when they looked more specifically at those results, those are some of the ones that seem to stand out the most from these surveys. And as we go on and talk a little bit, I'll try and address some of these things and show that even though they are challenging, they may not be quite as problematic as they seem to be uh, on the surface. Um, so what about from the other end? What are some of the challenges that researchers might face if they're trying to examine the relationship between exercise and Parkinson's disease? Uh, well, as you can imagine, uh, research projects looking at these things can require a lot of resources. They can require a lot of time and staff exercise on its own takes a lot of time. It has to be done for a certain amount of time, several days a week, in order to be effective. And if you're doing it as part of a research project, it should be done consistently and according to protocol. So you want to have people who can monitor that and coach people through the exercise who would be available for those things. Um, it can also be hard to get large numbers of participants for projects like this. People may not be able or willing to commit to long-term projects with a lot of exercise during the week. So those things can be challenging. Um, and also, as you can imagine, there's lots and lots of different ways to exercise, and there's lots and lots of different ways to check if exercise may have positive benefits. Um, so if there's many different studies looking at these potential different relationships, it can be hard maybe to make generalizations on what those relationships are and hard to maybe make recommendations to patients about what might be good. Um, so to illustrate that a little bit more, um, we see two columns here. So in the column on the left, we have different kinds of exercise that can be done. They're not all by any means, but things like we mentioned endurance exercise, resistance training, physical therapy, and some of these others. And then in the other column on the right, we have different outcomes or different results that can be checked with these studies. So things like motor function, motor symptoms, how well someone is able to walk, um, if it may affect their falling risk or falling frequency, cardiovascular fitness, all these other things. Um, so if you're thinking about designing a research study with exercise in Parkinson's disease, you could imagine taking any one of the kinds of exercise from the column on the left and drawing a line to any one of the possible outcomes from the column on the right. And if you have many different studies with many different lines connecting things from the different columns, you can imagine how it might be hard to make sense of those things and how it might be hard to make generalizations based off of that. Um, so that's one of the challenges that we face too. Um, but in spite of those things, there are some patterns that I think we see, and there are some benefits um, that we can see from exercise, and so we'll talk about some of those things. Um, before, though, we get to talking about people with Parkinson's disease, I think it's worthwhile talking about some of what we've learned from looking at animals, specifically rodents and rats who have symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Um, so researchers can look at these rodents, look at these rats, and they can exercise them and then see what their results are. 
Uh, so they can use things like treadmills or running wheels. I don't know if the treadmill there is exactly the kind of treadmill that was used, but it's still funny to see a rat on a treadmill. So we have that there. And there are some promising results that we've seen from those things. So, um, and there is some information to indicate that animals who exercise intensively in this way, um, it may actually affect how the disease progresses over time, and it may slow down possibly the disease progression for the symptoms uh, in these animals. And if you remember, that's something that I said would be potentially a very exciting result, something that we don't necessarily have uh, at this time. And there are some caveats to that, and that has to do with the timing of when they exercise these rats in relation to when they had the symptoms. And if they're looking at these rats, what they do is they expose them to certain toxins that we know can cause Parkinson's disease or symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And the studies that had the best results were those that were done um, either before or during the time that the animals were exposed to the toxins. And so if you're thinking about what that might mean for people who have Parkinson's disease, with the rats, we know exactly what it is and when it's happening that's causing the Parkinson's disease. But with people, we don't exactly know that at this time. We don't exactly know what the specific triggers are and what causes the disease to come about. So if you have an intervention that may affect how the disease progresses, but that intervention needs to be done early on, even potentially before someone is ex exposed to a certain trigger, it can be challenging, as you can imagine, if you don't know what that trigger uh, might be. Uh, but you could also argue if the intervention that you're thinking about is exercise, or you could say that, well, then people should be exercising all the time, and then if they're maybe predisposed to Parkinson's disease and have some risk, if they're exposed to some potential trigger, then if they're already exercising, then that may reduce their risk or may potentially change how the disease progresses over time. And I think there's some truth to that. Um, and they've also looked and seen some promising results um, for rats who were exposed to this toxin and were exercised afterwards, so people or excuse me, rats who already had the disease, um, they saw that these rats seem to have improved motor function and, and may also have prolonged activity of the chemical called dopamine in their brain, and that's the chemical that we know is deficient in Parkinson's disease. Um, it's important to say that these findings haven't been replicated directly in humans, so we don't know for sure if the same thing happens in humans, but still promising and exciting results that we have, I think. And then from there, we'll move on to what we've seen in humans with Parkinson's disease. Uh, as we look through the studies, um, a lot of times they'll break things down by types of exercise. So uh, I've done that here for part of the talk that we'll go through. And we'll start here with resistance training. And if you remember, um, that's the kind of exercise that involves moving a, a body part or a limb against resistance, things like weight training or exercise machines, as you see here. And there are some benefits that we see from that type of exercise in Parkinson's disease patients. Um, perhaps not surprisingly, people seem to have improved muscle strength and muscle size. And as you can imagine, that can be helpful if there's symptoms that affect movement and balance. And if people are stronger and have better muscle function, then they may be better able to compensate as the symptoms get worse. Um, there's some indication that resistance training may help to improve walking and speed of walking. And also, as they look at these patients who do this type of exercise and they these patients report on how their quality of life is overall and how they enjoy their life overall. Um, there's some possible indications that patients may report improved quality of life with this type of exercise. Um, those are not as consistent as some of the other things that I mentioned, but still a potential result there. It does also seem, as we look at the, the data and the evidence that we have, that something called progressive resistance training seems best. And what we mean by that is training that gets increasingly difficult as someone becomes stronger as they train. So for example, if someone is weightlifting, if the weights that they're using are increased as they become stronger during the exercise regimen, um, that would be an example of progressive resistance training as opposed to training where the resistance or the weight is, is stable during the course of the exercise. And they've done some relatively longer term studies on these things, even up to two years or so, and looked at the benefits during this time. And there was one study that did show good benefit, improved motor function for, for patients who had resistance training over two years, and that benefit was retained during that amount of time compared to the people who, uh, who did not do the same amount of exercise. And from there, we'll move on to aerobic exercise. So that's the exercise that's done generally to improve cardiovascular health and heart health. 
And again, not surprisingly, it can have that effect in patients with Parkinson's disease, and the benefits from that would, of course, apply to these patients as well. Um, and there's some other benefits that we see. The relationships may not be as strong as some of the other ones that I've mentioned, but there is some indication that it can improve motor function and motor symptoms in these patients um, as they look at the scores for motor function and certain measures of those things that involve things like stiffness and slowness, people seem to do better. Um, it may also improve walking speed and performance and may improve balance as well. Um, so some promising information for aerobic exercise there. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about physical therapy too. Um, and like I said before, there can be a lot of variability in how physical therapy is applied and it can be tailored to specific individuals and what their needs are and what their goals are. Um, but in spite of that, there do seem to be some patterns that emerge for physical therapy. It seems to have benefit um, with walking speed and benefit with balance and also benefit with freezing or freezing of gait. And that, as maybe you know, is if someone has the disease and they get to a point where they're trying to walk or trying to take a step and their feet seem stuck to the floor and they just can't get themselves to take a step, um, that's freezing and we see it fairly often. And, and that may also be improved with physical therapy. Um, there's some specific physical therapy programs that have been developed for Parkinson's disease especially. Um, one of those is called LSVT-BIG, and you may have heard of that. LSVT stands for Lee Silverman Voice Training. It was originally developed as a kind of speech therapy and was adapted for Parkinson's disease. Um, the speech therapy was originally meant to help people speak more loudly and more clearly. Um, and then so similarly with LSVT Big that focuses on movement, it, the goal is to help people um, have larger movements and more easy movements. Um, so that's done with movements of large amplitude, so big movements, sense the name, uh, with high intensity, and again, the goal to improve movement over time. Um, and there's been studies that have compared LSVT Big to other kinds of exercise and physical activity to see if there's benefit there. Um, and so they've compared it to something called Nordic walking, which is kind of this intensive walking where people have these poles that look kind of like ski poles and they walk with high intensity. And then they've also compared LSVT Big to unsupervised exercise. So people who don't have a specific exercise program that they're assigned to, but maybe you're just exercising at home in a way that is um, preferable to them. Um, and there are some benefits of LSVT big that seem to emerge when they compare to these things. Improved motor function and improved walking performance seem to be advantages. Um, and um, there have been some further developments since then. There's been some other types of physical therapy that have been developed from and similar to LSVT big that have some more flexibility and um, more um, ability to, to tailor the treatment to the specific patient's needs. So um, definitely some good things there that we see. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some other exercises that people can do and that can be popular. Um, tai Chi is one of those that can be widely used. Tai Chi is a form of martial arts that focuses on slow control of movement. It focuses on strength and movement in different directions. Um, and there's been some studies looking at Tai Chi specifically, and there's some information to show that it may help with control of posture, so um, helping with some of the stooping of posture that can occur, help people to stand up more straight. Um, there's one study that looked at um, Tai Chi and showed that it may have some benefit on balance and may help to decrease falls. And if it's focusing on strength and slow control, it, it makes sense that that would be the case. Um, Dance is another one that we have a lot of reasons that we think may be helpful for Parkinson's disease um, specifically. And if you see here, we say that it combines musical cues and spatial awareness and focuses on strength and balance. And those things can all be helpful and we can break that down a little bit. Um, so musical cues, you would say, is a form of an external cue and external cues can be helpful for patients with Parkinson's disease. For example, if someone is stuck or frozen, sometimes thinking about external cues can help them to overcome that and, and take a step or initiate movement. Um, so for example, if someone is stuck or frozen and they look down and see a line on the floor and try and step over that line, that can help to overcome that. So that would be an external visual cue. Um, so music has external auditory cues. It can be associated with the rhythm or the music of dance, and that can also help to initiate movement or help movement to happen more easily. Um, spatial awareness is something that we know is affected in Parkinson's disease too. So people have 
um, deficiencies in processing how things move in space in relation to one another, how things might be arranged in space in relation to one another, and that can cause problems. Um, so if someone is doing dancing that focuses on those things, then those problems may improve somewhat. And balance and strength are a little bit more self-explanatory, but also a focus there. Um, dance can also be good because it focuses on peer support and focuses on social engagement, and of course those are good things. Dance is usually done with partners or in groups of people, so loved ones and caregivers and partners can be recruited for that too and can help out with those things. Um, there's been specific studies looking at different kinds of dance, so things like waltz and tango and foxtrot, and they have seen some benefits there. It seems to help with balance and walking. Um, there was a study that looked at a tango program that lasted for a year, and that one did seem to show improved motor function overall and decreased freezing. Um, when they looked at the results of that study also, people who were involved in the tango program um, seemed to have improved measures in some other skills, some of the things that they check that they're able to do with their hands and how fast they do those things. Um, so that would suggest also that maybe some of the skills that they learn in tango dancing can be transferable to other skills that people might use in everyday life. Um, so some exciting things there too. Um, but what about falls? And we know that falls can be a big cause of injury and concern and worry for patients. Um, and it's something that if you've been following along, we haven't talked about so far yet, um, in great detail at least. And, and falls can be challenging for patients. Um, and we don't have great medications that can affect falls or can reduce the risk of falls. And unfortunately, similarly, when we look at these studies on exercise, we don't see um, a lot of encouraging results. A lot of the studies that are done don't seem to show big improvements with falls or don't seem to show a significant reduction in the rates of falls. There was one analysis that was done of many different studies, and they looked at falling risk and falling rates. Um, and that did, study did suggest that perhaps there was a decrease in fall rate in people who were exercising. Um, they said also that they didn't see a number or a change in the number of fallers. And what I mean by that is that if someone has a fall or if someone was going to fall, then they would be considered a faller, right? So it may not change that if someone is going to fall. They may still have that, but it may perhaps change how often they would fall or how many times they would fall, some information to support that. Um, unfortunately, also for that analysis, they didn't specify what types of exercise they were looking at. Um, so some encouraging results, but perhaps is not as much um, as we'd like to see. Um, so that leaves us still wondering, well, what else can we do about falls and what can we do to help reduce the risk of falls? And of course, there's some obvious ones, assistive devices, things like walkers or even wheelchairs can be helpful. Assistance from caregivers can be helpful too. Um, but there's another study that I think is worth mentioning with regard to falls. Um, there was a study that looked at things that may increase the risk of falls in Parkinson's disease patients. And one of the things they looked at was how confident people were in their balance, or in other words, how afraid they might be of falling. And as they followed these patients over time, they saw that patients who rated their confidence with balance at a lower level or maybe more afraid of falling, those patients seemed to fall more often as they followed them through the course of the study. Well, it's a complicated issue, and you could say, well, if they're afraid of falling, maybe with good reason, they know they may be at higher risk, and that's why they're falling. But at the same time, it, it does suggest possibly that fear of falling on its own is an independent factor that may increase one's risk for falling. So in other words, if you're more afraid of falling, that fear on its own may lead you to be more likely to fall. Um, and so um, in that case, then, if we can help to address that fear, help someone to feel more confident in their balance, then that might lead to reduced risk of falling. And I think exercise can be helpful for that if there's physical therapy or other exercise programs that can help to um, increase one's confidence in their balance, and that might be helpful. And of course, it is possible to be overconfident in your balance and do things that might, um, might not be best for someone, and that also can increase the risk of falls. So it's important to use good common sense there. Um, but I, I do think if we can address that fear that that might reduce the risk of falls somewhat, and an exercise may be helpful for that. Um, so now we'll shift a little bit and talk about some of the potential results for exercise on the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And if you remember, some of those that I mentioned are things um, like depression or sleep problems, changes in cognition, constipation. Um, and those symptoms can be some of the most troubling for Parkinson's patients. Um, and likewise, there's a lot of medications that can be used for the motor symptoms and a lot of medications that have formal approval by the FDA for use. 
uh, on Parkinson's disease for motor symptoms. But on the other hand, for non-motor symptoms, there's less medications that are available and less tools that we have. There's um, very few if, um, that are approved by the FDA for different non-motor symptoms. So they can be challenging to treat and they can be troublesome for people. Um, likewise, there's relatively little evidence. There's fewer studies looking at the effects of exercise on non-motor symptoms. We do have some information to go off of, and we'll talk about that. Um, but one other thing that we have to go off of that we can use um, in place of that while we're waiting for some of that other information to come through is what we know about exercise on similar symptoms in healthy people who don't have Parkinson's disease. That can also be helpful to think about those things too. Um, so we'll go more specifically now um, and talk about some of the non-motor symptoms. Cognition is one that can be challenging and can be problematic for people, and that refers to mental processes like thinking and memory that can be affected with Parkinson's disease. Uh, so if we look at what we know about exercise and cognition in healthy people, we do see some benefit there. Um, people seem to have um, improved attention, improved processing speed with exercise, and that effect seems stronger when aerobic and resistance exercise are combined. Um, for Parkinson's disease specifically, um, different kinds of exercise that we talked about um, can show some improvement on cognition when they um, test some of these things like um, memory and attention span. Um, sometimes patients do score higher if they're exercising on a regular basis. Um, in Parkinson's disease for these measures. Um, it seems like the evidence for aerobic exercise may be a little bit stronger for resistance training. Um, there was one study for treadmill exercise, intensive treadmill exercise that seemed to show good results and improved scores on cognition. It's also worth saying, I think, that the effects that they saw were greatest for mild to moderate symptoms, mild to moderate disease, as opposed to more advanced disease. So that would suggest then if if you're going to try to use exercise as a way to maybe help some of these things, that it's um, better done earlier on in the course of the disease than later on. Um, we can talk about sleep, too. And contrary to what our sleeping friend there, who looks like he's sleeping very comfortably, might suggest, sleep can be a big problem for people. Um, people can have increased daytime sleepiness. They can have trouble sleeping at night. And, um, disturbing dreams, those things can be problematic. In healthy individuals, like I said before, uh, we see that exercise can help to improve daytime sleepiness, it can help to improve quality of sleep, um, it can help to decrease the need for medication to assist with sleep. Um, and in Parkinson's disease, we do see that some people who exercise report improved sleep quality, um, though the results are not always consistent. Some of the studies don't show significant results, um, but others do. Um, and then we can talk about mood also. Um, and like I said before, in the general population, we know that exercise can be helpful for treating things, um, symptoms of anxiety and depression, those things can improve. Um, there's not a lot of studies looking at mood and exercise and Parkinson's disease. And part of that is because a lot of the participants don't necessarily have um, severe problems with mood at the start of the studies. So people are not necessarily severely depressed at the beginning of the studies. So you can imagine if that's the case, it can be hard to tell if there's a big difference from the start to the end of the study. Um, but in some cases, people do report improved mood with exercise and Parkinson's disease in, in some of these studies. Um, so overall, those are some of the benefits that we see. Um, are there risks associated with Parkinson's disease and exercise? Um, is there a reason to be afraid of incurring uh, injury or more likelihood of injury with exercise in these patients? Um, and of course, injuries can occur with exercise. People can have muscle injuries, they can have joint injuries or falls can happen. Uh, when they look at the studies that have been done or when we look at these studies, um, they don't necessarily seem to show worse an outcome in Parkinson's disease patients who exercise. The outcomes seem to be pretty good, as I've suggested. Um, and they don't necessarily show higher rates of injuries or falls in people who exercise on a regular basis. Uh, we should say that a lot of these studies tend to enroll people who have relatively mild symptoms um, or who are at early stages or earlier stages. So it is important to keep that in mind. And um, if one's going to exercise, they should do so um, you know, according to their abilities and keep their limitations in mind. But the evidence that we do have doesn't necessarily support that exercise uh, might be more dangerous for these patients. Um, so also encouraging there. Um, so we'll go through some concluding points, some summary points then. Um, so we do see obviously clear benefits from exercise in the general population. Um, there are of course uh, distinct challenges for patients who are 
um, trying to exercise and their challenges in studying the effects of exercise on Parkinson's disease patients. Um, and that can lead to some difficulty in making generalizations, but we do see some patterns that come out. Um, there's some evidence that may suggest that exercise may slow or change how disease progresses. That mostly comes from animal studies, like I mentioned, um, that haven't necessarily been replicated in humans, but some promising results. Um, and we do see that in people that exercise likely has benefit for motor function, things like walking ability, um, maybe balance, those sorts of things. And it may also be helpful with non-motor symptoms, so the evidence is not perhaps as strong. Um, so um, a combination of different types of exercise may be best, some combination of aerobic and resistance exercise, for example, or um, dance and physical therapy we think are also helpful. Um, we would say that exercise should be done in the on state, or what we mean, mean by that is when the medications are in effect. So if medications are helping to improve the symptoms, improve motor function, and improve movement, then one would be able to exercise better and more easily with those medications. Um, exercise programs should be tailored to the individual, tailored to specific needs of the individual and what their goals are, their preferences might be. Um, and in general, we do need more work and more research to confirm some of these things that I mentioned, and hopefully the results may be a little bit stronger. And also to see if specific types of exercise may be better than other types of exercise. Um, we don't have that information as easily available right now. And then to finish, we'll go back to this slide that we mentioned. Um, and go through some of the barriers. And so um, they can be challenging, like I said, and I don't think totally eradicated by what we've talked about this morning, but um, low expectations. We do have reason to think that there's benefit with exercise and Parkinson's disease. Um, bad weather, the weather is still nice in Southern California. Uh, lack of time, I think that it's, it is worthwhile to make time to exercise. Pain is a little bit more challenging. There may be some help with depression um, and fear of falling. We don't see clear evidence for increased risk of falling with exercise. And if that fear is addressed, there's some suggestion that that may also reduce the risk of falling. So our friend here, if you remember from before, he was overwhelmed and not motivated to exercise. Now he's happy in doing perhaps some kind of Tai Chi or yoga or something like that. So, uh, so thank you very much for your attention. And um, I think we'll have time for questions um, with the panel discussion that'll follow. So thank you.